It's not just listening to the big picture. It's all those little details. That's where the magic happens, right? It's really educational to, to work on stuff that's not necessarily um, your instrument. I just start almost playing it like a record in my head. Um, what do you think is the first point that we could, that we all think about that we think might benefit other people too? G'day, Nigel here, and welcome to the Sax School Online Podcast. In this very first episode, we're going to be discussing the things that you can do to make the best progress on your saxophone this year. Plus, we're going to be giving you a little peek behind the curtain at what's coming up on the podcast uh, throughout the rest of this year. It's a brand new project. We're super excited about it. And to help move the discussion today from the Sax School Tutor team, I've got my two favorite guys, Fred Victor and Joel Pennell. How are you doing, guys? Good. Very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Hey, just before we do uh, get started, though, if you do love learning about how to play saxophone better and uh, and you enjoy the podcast today, it would just mean the world to us if you could share this podcast with somebody else because it would help us to reach more friends like you and spread the message about what we're doing with the podcast. So we've got a lot to dig into in this very first episode and we wanted to choose a really important topic because although we're recording at the beginning of the year, I think all the way through the year we should be thinking about how we can make the best progress in our practice. We're thinking about it as tutors and I'm sure you guys should be thinking about it too. So we've got six points that we all think about that help us with our own practice and we also share with our thousands of students inside SAC School and we're going to be sharing them with you today as well. Before we dig into that, though, hey, I'm curious to know what you guys have been up to. So, Fred, what's been going on with you this past week or so? Um, I will, uh, we're uh, gearing up for the 2024 Average White Band final tour. This is it. It's the, uh, the Pack Up the Pieces tour. That's what the T-shirts are going to say. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we're getting ready to do that. We have a, a nice three-week tour of uh, the UK, Scotland, and England coming up. And, of course, the dates for the U.S. are just starting to come in. But it's going to be a pretty busy year for me, I think. For us, yes. Looking forward to it. Wow, that sounds really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing you over here, Fred, actually. I know you've got some dates in the UK. We'll be we'll be coming along and, uh, and uh, watching. Watching, watching your fingers really closely from the uh, from the audience. <laughs> I'm so right. nervous. So much might pressure. Do of, might do a bit of heckling as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> what about you, Joel? What's been keeping you busy? Oh, I've been uh, working on some new courses for inside Sat School Online. Uh, lots of stuff on uh, training your ears and uh, oral resources. So uh, we've had some pitch matching courses and. This month, we've got some interval courses being released and lots of others to come as well. Modes, chords, all sorts of stuff. So I've been working on all that content. I've also been doing some uh, some recording sessions with an artist I work with from London called Ashley Reeks, who's actually a bit out of my comfort zone, uh, to be honest. It's not, it's not jazz as I'm used to. It's actually prog rock. So... Uh, and uh, very difficult prog rock as well. Uh, lots of odd time signatures and stuff. So it's a real challenge and somewhat, somewhat a bit different. But I've been working with him for about 10 years. He's prolific. We're working on his next six albums. Wow. Probably. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, lots to do there. Lots to do there. Wow. And does he have uh, written out charts or are you doing it all by ear? What's the process? No, no, nothing's written out. He kind of sings or plays it all. And then I have to go in the studio. He plays it at me. I've got to kind of memorize it on the spot and work it out and then uh, put it down and then create all the harmonies for it as well because wow. i'm the the uh, horn player for the entire horn section wow it's the joel pennell horn section <laughs> it really is it's intense <laughs> good fun though great stuff really interesting music very dark wow yeah i think you know even if it's out your comfort zone i think that can make the project even more interesting because uh, it forces you into places that you don't normally go with your playing so yeah that sounds fascinating Without a doubt, I like a challenge. There you go. Well, I've been busy. <laughs> I've been busy challenging myself too. My thing that I've been working on for last, well, throughout January really, is trying to transition from a bigger mouthpiece to a smaller mouthpiece. So I've traditionally played like size seven or eight on alto and, and tenor, and I've got a size five on my alto, size five mouthpiece, and a size six on my tenor, and I've just been sort of bringing things right back to the basics and seeing if I can get a good sound on a small. Uh, mouthpiece with a light setup. So that's been a fun 
process. I'm sure we'll talk more about that on the podcast. Um, the other thing that I've been super busy with is we've got our sax school weekender coming up in April. So I've been busy writing music and planning and preparing stuff for that. Still a lot of work left to do, but it's going to be awesome. We've got 60 people of 60 of our members from all over the world who are joining us in England for four days this time. So it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So that's been keeping me busy. Okay, well, let's get stuck into our main topic for today. So I really wanted to dig into this really important topic because um, I think it's so important for all of us to be thinking about. But before we start sharing these six points that we are all using uh, that I think you guys can benefit from, I'm curious to know what things in your playing you guys are working on. Like, So Fred, have you got some playing goals that you've set for yourself for this year? Um, I'm really just, you know, for me, it's just, doing the work constantly just keeping at it uh i've been working on a lot of um uh transcriptions of instruments other than saxophone i'm right now working on a uh clifford brown solo because it's a it's a whole different head when you're not you know you can get a lot out of uh out of working on solos that are not necessarily saxophone so um, i've been doing that and that's a challenge for a, a lot of reasons because sometimes you have to go like working in the altissimo or working out of the range of the instrument or figuring out how to how to actually execute it but that's that's my big uh, that's my big time that's what's taking up a lot of my practice time right now i think that's really interesting fred so uh trumpet solo is one thing do you ever have you done other instruments as well like i don't know a guitar yeah, or I did a piano a, or i did a uh, i did a um i worked on a brad meldow solo which on it on a song that i'd never heard before and uh it was a, st a standard called uh, um, nobody else but me i think and uh and his whole uh, approach to time is really uh very unsaxophonic and saxophonistic um <laughs> yeah so yeah but, but uh, those are it's really educational to, to work on stuff that's not necessarily um your instrument there's a guy on the internet that does like blues guitar solos on a saxophone which is and it's it's amazing really wow so it's it's inspiring it's very inspiring yeah i think it's interesting because when we if we're a tenor player, let's say, and we're transcribing a tenor solo, there's a lot of stuff I find when I'm transcribing that I you can work it out quickly because you know the sound when you move from that note to that note. We're all used to the uh, the technical hurdles on a saxophone, and you can hear it in somebody else's playing, right? Even if they're a really great player. Yeah. It makes it easier. But then if you start transcribing another instrument, like I remember when I was um, doing a lot of flute practice and I'd be working on some violin things, for example, completely different technical hurdles there. And so it pushes you into all these different places. Yeah, it's a great challenge. Oh, you, you're making yeah, me really want to is. go do that now. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been working on, in my practice, my big thing that I've been uh, focusing on already in January and what I want to keep working through, apart from the changing mouthpiece thing, is just building confidence more in my super high altissimo. So I really want to get that. I, I enjoy playing up there. I enjoy the challenge of it, but I'm just trying to get it even more in tune. And also the other thing I've been focusing on is just revisiting some really advanced technical things. So that means going back to the basics and really slowing stuff down and trying to get my fingers faster and faster because I haven't done a lot of that sort of practice for a while. And I really enjoy that. So those have been my main things. What about you, Joel? What have you been working on? Yeah, well, a similar one to you, Nigel. I, I'm, I'm wanting, I like to try and match the ranges as much as possible between the two saxes that I play, which is basically alto and tenor. And I'm pretty comfortable up to altissimo D on alto so i've decided this year that i'd really like to be very comfortable up to altissimo g on tenor the one above the first altissimo g uh, i'm kind of there I'm, I'm quite happy up to f uh but g is still a bit of a gimmick note for me but i like to just make it part of my scales and part of my arpeggios and just uh, part of the the horn and a bit more of a natural usable way not that i'm going to use it too much because it's very high obviously well uh, I'd, I'd so like to, i'm going to be look I'd, I'd like to just stop you there joel because <laughs> i actually don't think that uh it's physically possible to play a high g and i think you might need a special license for it that's very high <laughs> well i won't be doing it when my wife's at home put it that way all right. How do the dogs in your neighborhood feel about this? Well, uh, I've got a little uh, little pack outside. <laughs> they come at practice time every day, every day for food. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's 
it's only as high as an Altus Modi on uh, on Alto at the end of the day, and uh, plenty of people do that. So so it is possible. I know the fingering. I just need to kind of get more used to it and not feel like it's too stratospheric from 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 that point of view. I find if you if you play things often enough, they start to normalise and uh, become something a bit more usable. So so that's one of the things. It's not one of the main things I'm going to look at. I've also recently, and I think Fred's got this book as well, got the uh, new Rick Margitza book. Is that how you say it? I think that's Rick how you Rick Margitza, yeah. Margitza, uh, yeah. Yeah, Margitza. Uh, which is such an interesting book. It's called 365 Days of Practice. Um, basically, uh, to kind of uh, paraphrase the entire book it's basically 365 very contemporary uh, phrase ideas over certain progressions but technically they're all quite challenging and conceptually they're quite challenging as well just a really interesting interesting book it's just i love working through things like that and just trying to find some different ideas and different ways of thinking about things uh and i find books like that uh, fascinating just to just to dip in and out of uh, i don't know i'm not necessarily going to do it in the order he suggested but uh it's one of those one of those books you can dip in from so they're my main two things um from a transcription point of view since we're all talking about transcription i've decided this year i'm going to focus on chris potter is going to be my uh, my focus this year uh someone i've listened to obviously uh but i've spent most of my life focused on transcriptions of certain other players like Bagonzi and brecker and alto players like parker and phil woods and realized i haven't really done lots of uh chris potter stuff which is a bit weird so there's a gap and uh i intend to fill it this year so wow that's I'm, what i'm up to i'm really excited to hear more about how that goes actually and also brilliant to hear that uh, i think all of us all three of us have got some interesting things to be digging into because we're all practicing hard as well and i think a lot of our students inside sax school forget that although although they're practicing hard we're also practicing hard every day too we've all got things that we're working on so getting on to these six points then joel um what do you think is the first point that we could so we all think about that we think might benefit other people too. Well, I think a couple of things, as we've all just said, you know, I think it's really good to have long-term goals uh, and not feel that everything you're working on is what am I doing just this week or where do I want to be in two weeks' time? You know, you can have these larger goals that can last you all year or a couple of years and that's absolutely fine as well. It helps you break them down and it gives you a bit of time and patience to get on with them, particularly if they're complicated. But I think the key thing here is just to keep everything simple. Think about the way that you split those up in your practice time. You know, remember those those kind of key things that you need to do in your practice. You need to do some warm-ups, but you can make them interesting. You can always find different ways of warming up. It doesn't have to just be a chromatic scale with long tones. You can use overtones. You can make tunes out of them. You can do two notes. You can apply it. There's always ways of doing it to make it interesting, but ultimately pick one and stick to it for a while. Keep it simple. Then I tend to move on to some kind of technical work that might be some scales or patterns or arpeggios or maybe at the moment it might be working on those areas in the altissimo as well but that might be a warm-up too who knows uh and then i move on to some some repertoire and you know do a bit of a warm down after that so i keep it quite simple uh from the point of view of that i don't try and take on too many tasks but i think by taking on bigger tasks i.e. over the whole year you can really simplify that process and uh, it all becomes a bit more clearer and planable which is really important plan your practice uh, don't hope it just kind of happens mm. I guess it also reminds me of that uh, that famous saying where people overestimate what they can do in a day and underestimate what they can do in a year right so we try and pack too much stuff into our practice but then forget that if we do a simple practice routine we actually see greater benefits over the long term of the year. So, yeah, I love that. Fred, what's the next thing do you think we should be thinking about? Well, I think it's really important to kind of commit to a schedule and and keep that and keep that schedule because you got to have some sort of routine as far as, you know, the time of day and those type of, th those type of things. And I also feel like um, I, I for a long time, I would just put put it off every day. And because I would feel like, oh, I don't have enough time to do my normal practice schedule, whatever it is, two hours or 90 minutes or whatever. So I would just put it off and I would say, oh, get to it the next day. And then unfortunately, 
doesn't always happen that way. You know, life gets in the way and you don't, you don't get, you don't get to do your, your, and then next thing you know, it's like three or four days have gone by. And then by then you don't want to pick up the saxophone because it's going to sound awful because you're, you feel like you're starting from scratch. So I, I feel like I, I kind of set myself a goal of, and this is going to sound ridiculous, of, of 15 minutes. And it almost never ends up being just 15 minutes. But if you give yourself at least the permission of just putting the horn in your mouth, I keep it on the stand so it's always here, and you play, and, and then you'll get, you won't be facing that blank page every day. And you won't, and it'll keep you from, you know, procrastinating. It's just knowing that everybody has 15 minutes. Do the 15, whether it's, you know, five minutes of long tones, five minutes of, you know, technique and, and one tune or something. But almost inevitably, it's going to end up more. You're, you're going to do whatever, an hour, two hours even. It can, but give yourself permission to just do 15 minutes. Yeah, I love that. That's I love that mine. giving you permission, self-permission idea too, Fred. It's brilliant. And I think the other thing that uh, I've found really helps me is prioritizing the practice as the, as the first thing that I do in my daily schedule. So uh, it's funny you say 15 minutes because, you know, I do that too. I've got a lot going on with SAC school. I've got a family. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I have to be really organized with my time. And maybe you guys listening, maybe you, you also have uh, a busy schedule. But I know that if I commit to doing that practice the very first thing of my long list of stuff to do, then it'll get done. Whereas if I don't do it in the first 15 minutes, um, which may end up being an hour or two hours of practice as it turns out, then invariably I won't get to it later on the day because stuff happens, right? Life happens and I get busy. Uh, so I try and prioritize it. But yeah, great tip. 15 minutes. My, my tip actually to share here is really about listening. This is something I'm, I'm always trying to do more of. I definitely want to do more of this year. Listening. So... It seems like an obvious point. However, I think most of us don't really actively listen. We just got music uh, happening around us, but we're not not actively making decisions about what we're listening to, and then not really engaging with what we're listening to. So, as saxophone players, it's so important to do a lot of your learning through listening. So that means exploring other artists. Um, so easy these days. Do you remember the old days? We used to go to the record shop or go and buy CDs or whatever, save your money up, and ah, oh, you know. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, and now Spotify, YouTube, you've got everything, right? So I think it's a great practice to be mindful about exploring new artists all the time. And then when you find something that you like, stick that in a playlist and come back to it and really listen to it deeply. Because if you can unlock all those little secrets, like for example, Joel listening to Chris Potter and transcribing, it's not just listening to the big picture, it's all those little details. That's where the magic happens, right? And so whether you're doing a Chris Potter solo or whether you're doing Baker Street, it's the same process, listening to all those details and really connecting with those recordings. So I find inspiration all the day, every all the time. In fact, just today, you guys were talking about Altissimo. And I was telling my son about the Michelle Camillo album, One More Once. You guys know that one? Yeah, it's a great album. Blew my mind in the mid-90s, early 90s when it came out. And I put on uh, one of the tracks for him on that. And Paquito de Rivera is doing a solo there. And oh, my God, his, his altissimo is just like otherworldly. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. And I'd, I'd forgotten, actually. So there you go. A little bit of inspiration in my little bit of listening today. So, Fred, uh, now that we've got those things in place, what's the next really important thing to be mindful of? Um, I think you have to anticipate that things are not going to go as planned when you're practicing. Um, I had a... Uh, uh, an accelerator student who was a Marine and they have a saying in the Marines, embrace the suck. That's their, that's what they say. And if you, if you go into it knowing that things are not going to go as planned and, and it's not always going to be, you're not always going to get, be able to play the scale and the hard keys or, or anything like that, then it, it you know, you'll 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 be much better off if you anticipate those kind of things, um, and can and that don't let it stop you from being consistent. Because if you don't do it again every day, you can't expect to ha to get results. And you're going to have days that are good and days that are bad. But be prepared for it, and then you 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 know you won't feel as bad, and you'll 
keep going. That's the it's it's the keep motivated is the thing, you know. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you you know, it's never a straight path, is it? When you're practicing something, and and to be honest with you, that's often when the 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 great things happen too. You know, when you come across those those little boundaries in your uh, practicing, when you push through them, it's you know, there's so much more learning to be done there. So yeah, that's a great tip. Uh, what about you, Joel? What's your other tip that you should share? Yeah, I mean, you know, what what Fred's saying as well is is really important if you want to progress in playing an instrument no matter what instrument it is you should be constantly looking for things that you can't do you know so you should expect not to be able to do them you can't do them you know that but if you pick those things over all the stuff that you can play really easily and you constantly search out stuff that is seems impossible i promise you you practice it and you practice it in a long-term way in an organized way one day you'll play it and you'll think back to that first day when you couldn't even play the first part and you realize you've actually made real progress so i constantly only look for things that i can't do there's no point in me practicing things i can already do so i think that's uh, that's one thing that maybe separates pros from beginners to some degree it's it's really nice to find that comfort zone when you're a beginner i can play this tune i'll play it again i'll play it again but you're not necessarily progressing find another tune that seems impossible and commit to it might take you a long time but you'll get there and i think the other thing that i try and do as much as possible in my practice is i look for habits so maybe that could just be the way that i'm practicing warm-ups let's just say for example i play from a low b flat and i move up chromatically playing long tones as soon as i notice that i've been doing that for a few days i say this really important phrase to me which is what if what if actually instead of doing that again what if i start right at the top and play down chromatically for a few days you know so i'm always trying to do that to mix things up i do it in improvisation all the time i always play up the chord tones today then i'm going to play down the chord tones i always seem to land on the third today i'm going to make sure i land on the fifth and as soon as you do that everything changes uh it forces you to completely look at things in a new way and ultimately you find new discoveries and you learn more and uh, that's something i try and ask myself as often as possible what if yeah i love that what if and you know the last point that i want to to mention that uh, actually ties in with all of what we're talking about today is just a reminder to record yourself as you're going through your practicing because you'll come up with those what if moments and you'll realize the things that are the hurdles and uh what things you want to improve by listening back to your recordings so it's something we talk to our sax school members about all the time and it's wonderful, actually, to see that same process. We've got a lot of, a lot of people learning with us, right? thousands of people learning with us. So we see the same things happen over and over. And so many times I've seen that reluctance uh, from a new student to actually making a recording and then sharing it. It's a bit scary, right? You're going to make a recording and share it in front of 3,000 of your peers, people who are also going through the same journey as you. But every single time when they do share, they 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 realize actually it's not scary it's actually really liberating and it's brilliant you get feedback from people and they do more and more of it so we've got such an active community of people sharing these recordings and by the way it's not just the students who are recording themselves i'm recording myself constantly every single day when i'm practicing i'm recording myself i keep these long logs of well this is the recording from last week oh yeah and this is where i am today and then sometimes i'll make a note on this is what mouthpiece i used and this is what read and it gets a little bit uh, over the top but it's so good for you <laughs> to hear because if you're only practicing and playing for yourself and then not listening back you don't really get a picture of what you actually sound like just to, to jump in there i mean i think the thing as well to point out particularly for people that have been playing a while and maybe aren't in the habit of recording yourself, is it costs nothing to record yourself anymore. You know, everyone's got a, a mobile phone that can record. Everyone's got a computer. You just press a button and you just leave it running. You don't have to go to maximum effort. Uh, you're not releasing an album or anything. Just press record. Why not? And if you never listen to it, you never listen to it. But it's there anyway uh, if you do want to have a listen to it. And uh, I think that's important important to realise, particularly for uh, the older generation like us. Hey, who are you calling old? 
<laughs> no, you're exactly right, though. We're so lucky. Just like we are saying before about we're lucky with being able to listen to lots of stuff. The amount of recording power technology we've got in our pocket now is just amazing. So, yeah, these tools can really help us. So we've got six really important points for you guys to think about. Think about keeping it simple. Thinking about committing to a schedule, even if it's just 15 minutes to start with. Thinking about listening to more recordings. Anticipating that there are going to be setbacks along the way, but you can overcome them, and that's where the great progress ha uh, moments happen in your development. And asking yourself, what if? Could you approach things differently today to what you did yesterday? Maybe that's going to unlock a whole bunch of new, exciting things in your playing. And then finally, using recording to help you monitor your progress as you're going through. So I hope that inspires you when you put some of those things into practice in your practice schedule starting from tomorrow or today if you're going to go and practice later on after listening to this why not go on but before you go <laughs> off and practice your saxophone uh, just a quick reminder that if you do enjoy the podcast today uh, particularly as we're just sort of trying to get things up and running here it, it, it would just be great if you could remember to follow the podcast so you see the future episodes that we will be bringing out and if you feel particularly motivated then a five-star review would be awesome. Thanks so much. Okay, I wanted to share a little bit about what's coming up on this podcast. This is episode number one, and we've been talking about this podcast for ages, haven't we, amongst the team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. Planning, scheming, doing research, thinking about all the great things that we could do, talking to our members. But we do have a load of stuff um, planned. What sort of things uh, can you let people know that we're going to be doing uh, coming up, Joel? What sort of things can people expect to hear on the podcast? Well, apart from other uh, super interesting discussions like we've just had uh, <laughs> about, about, about what we're up to, we're also going to have some guests on. I'm not going to tell you who they are yet. You'll have to wait and see for that. Ooh. We're going to have some guest players on. And uh, we're also going to have some visits from uh, saxophone designers and makers and people that make mouthpieces and other gadgets and goodies for saxophone. Absolutely. And on that topic, Fred, uh, can you give us some ideas of some of the other things we're going to be covering? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, we're going to have some tip. We're going to have tips on gear and we're going to talk about our various gigging experiences and also, you know, how to learn saxophone better. That's why we're here. That's what we all want to know about. And the other thing we want to really do on this podcast is answer your questions. So if you've got something that you need some help with, or if you've got a guest you'd like to see us talk to, or if you've got a piece of equipment that you're curious about, then send us an email uh, at support at saxschoolonline.com. And if we can make it happen, we would love to do that for you. And speaking of questions, we've actually got our very first question, and that's from one of our sax school members called Todd. So Todd wrote in, actually there's a three points to this question, so there's a lot, lot for us to talk about here, but Todd writes that he's now the lead tenor in a fun jazz group, but he needs some help. So he's asking, what's the right way to count in the band when they're doing standards like Tenor Madness or something like that? And also he's curious, how much should he play when somebody else in the band is taking a solo? I thought that was an interesting question. And the final thing he was curious about was if he is taking a longer solo, well, how does he let the rest of the band know that he's finished with the solo and he needs to get out? So lots to talk about there. Um, Joel, let's start with counting in the band. It's really easy when you're counting in a band to get a little bit excited. You're a bit nervous, especially if it's something you're not used to doing and the one thing you don't want to do is count it in at completely the wrong tempo and before you know it you're playing Tenor Madness like it's uh, Coltrane's Impressions or Giant Steps, something like that. Uh, and it just doesn't sound right, doesn't sit right, you know, ballads, obviously you want to get those tempos right. So the way that I generally always go about doing that is I just sing part of the tune. I don't think about tempo, I try to completely not think about what speed I want the tune to be. I just start almost playing it like a record in my head. And once it's clear in my head, then I get the tempo from what I'm hearing. And I find that's a really natural way to, to get that correct tempo because as soon as you decide a tempo and then hear the tune in your head, it seems to fit. 
and then you count it in and when you start playing you realize that that is completely the wrong tempo so always doing it that way round is really useful for getting that speed before you start and then just basically make sure you're looking at the band they need to see you uh they need to see some kind of physical movement that could be clicking your fingers or uh, it could be just you verbally kind of mouthing the numbers which is something you're going to want to do i always give two bars in uh, so it might be one two one two three four for example uh, because quite often tunes have pickups as well and uh, if you only give one bar in you might particularly as a saxophone player, where you've got to shove it in your mouth, if you like. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you, you might get one, two, and uh, you don't give a, a nice clear count into the band. So just making it clear, making sure that you face them when you do that, give them enough kind of uh, cue, if you like, from the point of view of your counting. Two bars is generally more than enough. And I think most importantly, really listen to that tune in your head before you decide what tempo you think it should be at. Yeah, and relax. relax. And relax. Take a breath. Yeah. Always relax. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's, it, it sounds like such a simple thing, but actually it, it takes a bit of practice and a bit of thinking through to be good at that. And uh, also the point that you made there, Joel, which I think is super important that a lot of people don't think about is the eye contact point. You know, really really connecting with everybody, making sure they're watching you and, and they're, they're watching for the count-off that you're giving. Um easy to forget yes. I, I think i think the eye contact thing is is key to all these points in one way or another to be honest 100 percent. and on yeah. that point um fred what would you say to todd about how much he should play when somebody else is doing a solo that's that's an interesting question um i it, when somebody else is playing a solo if you're the saxophonist um I, unless you're playing like a rhythmic you know a riff or something as a backing part you shouldn't be doing any kind of soloing if somebody else is soloing but you can come up with you know some sort of rhythmic thing or maybe you hear the drums playing something and you want to accent you know repetitive you don't want to just play sporadic stuff that doesn't make sense because then it takes away from the the actual soloist but yeah, you can come up with little backgrounds, background things, but try to be consistent with them, you know, and and stick to the groove. But uh, yeah, that's a it's a I'm not yeah I think that's what that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I I, I wouldn't I don't know what you think about this, Joel, but I would default to not playing anything when somebody else is playing a solo because that's their moment. Yeah, yeah. I think the clue's in the name. It's their solo, not yours. Yeah. Uh, so. So I tend to never play uh, unless I'm requested to by the soloist, unless uh, the band leader says I'd like this particular thing in the last chorus of the guitar yeah. solo. Uh, then, then maybe I will come up with something, like Fred said, some kind of riff or some long tones or something like that. But generally, my default position is not to touch the saxophone. It's one of the beauties of being a saxophonist. You can have a rest. Exactly. You know, don't feel don't feel like you're not uh, giving the band their money's worth or anything like that. It's uh, it's absolutely fine. It's the right thing to do. What you don't want to do is get in the way of somebody doing their solo, uh, right. because if it, that happened to you and the guitar player started riffing halfway through your subtle kind of beautiful kind of solo, then uh, then you're not going to be very happy with them, and you'll find the same's true of other instrumentalists if you start fiddling around behind them. So uh, just uh, don't do anything. Just uh, listen and enjoy it. Nod your head and uh, look like it's you a, like it. That's what it's I a do. great it's a great time to go to the bar. Go oh. get a beer. That's... Yes. Uh, so, and the third part of Todd's question was, uh, so he's, he's decided to take a few extra choruses over Tenor Madness. How does he let everybody know that he's going to get, he's getting to the end of his solo and he, he wants to get out and wants the band to come back in? So uh, I, I would just say to you, Todd, going back to Joel's point about eye contact with everybody. So this is a tricky one, right? A lot of us will have seen a great band up on stage or maybe a YouTube video of a great band that played together for a thousand gigs and then so, like miraculously when someone finishes a solo, they just know what's happening and there's all this stuff that just happens and no one seems to ever indicate anything. And that's because they are all so used to each other's body language but also the way that they um, play solos their approach to solos i bet on average white band you probably don't have to give people a lot of visual um, cues fred because you have been doing it for years right, right however yeah. 
then it can be confusing if you're relatively new to the thing of playing in a band and you have this situation where you get to the end of your solo and nobody else seems to realize that you're at the end of your solo. Okay, so we need to build up this communication is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so I think at the start it needs to be quite obvious and there's nothing wrong with making eye contact, giving people a clear visual cue that you're at the end of your solo and then it's time for the next um, yeah. section. Similarly, if you're coming to the end of a song or if you're doing a tag or if you've uh, got some sort of you know, big section change in the music. So I think it's always good to be uh, very careful about your eye contact and be very clear with your cues as well. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, it is all about, you know, cues come in many forms. There can be visual cues, for example, if it's my solo and we're going to go back into the head after it, little classic cues like tapping your head is enough to let a band know that you're back to the head. Uh, just simply turning round as a sax player, you're generally at the front. So if you turn round and face the bar, the band to some degree, you can still keep on the mic. You just stand to the side of the mic and start to turn round four bars before you want to end. Then that's generally enough of a cue to let them know that things are about to move on. And also musically, the way you kind of bring your solo to an end. So you don't want to be ending uh, at the peak of your solo, you know, you want to bring down and you're probably going to play a little bit less and leave a bit more space and finish that last phrase and things like that. So it's the combination of all those things. One thing I would say is don't assume that they're going to pick up just from a cue like that. It's the combination of these cues. I turn to the side, I tap my head and I bring down my solo. So it's all these things make it really, really clear to the band that it's uh, time to move on to the next section of an ex-soloist or you could just give a nod to the next soloist. Uh, generally, you should have agreed a solo order beforehand. So hopefully if it's the guitar next, they're already kind of looking at you at the end of each chorus that you're playing, waiting for you to cue them. So just give them a nod and uh, take the sax out of your mouth and get yourself to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to point out, it's not all about the bar. <laughs> By the way, we always know when Fred's solos are coming to an end because that's the point where all the audience have just gone mental and everyone's yes, screaming and exactly. applauding. And that's, yeah, that, that's so we know. Yeah, that roses, roses coming roses. up on stage. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, we've covered some really great stuff today. So uh, thanks so much for sticking with us. And if you'd like to revisit this episode or you're curious to um, listen to some sections again or, or learn more about it, well, we've got the full transcript of the episode over at saxschoolonline.com slash podcast. Um, yeah, so go check it out over there. That's where you can find the resource for all the episodes. And remember that if you're not already a member of Sat School, then there's the 14-day free trial. Just go and visit uh, Sat School online and click on that, and you can get access to all the thousands of lessons in there and a bit of help from us while you're at it. Yeah, why not? And also connect with some of our other members in our community that we were talking about earlier on. Uh, so, Fred, tell us what's coming up next uh, next episode. Nigel, I thought you'd never ask. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be back uh, next time. We're gonna talk about um, uh, our fa some of our favorite warm up routines that actually work. And uh, hope you can join us for that one. Yeah, should be great. It's a great topic to dig into too. So hey, thanks again for sticking with us today. I really hope you've enjoyed it. All that's left to say is keep practicing hard, and we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.